kill your version. What is the title? Redemption Song with Full Whalers back in. Oh, that's great. That's a real collector's item. What's the dub of it on the other side? No, it's another track. More known track. The, the version of Redemption Song is extremely interesting. Zion Express? Yes. What's that? It's on some album. It's an instrumental? No, no, it's a late 70s uh, track, which is off uh, an album you probably produced. Nothing oh. called Zion Express. Yeah. Well, then it's a new track. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Zion Express? Is it vocal on it? Zion Express? No, that's, that's right. Well, I can't think of it. Maybe you're right, yeah. Probably you are. Right? Something like that. And I never liked the instrument, the, 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 the version of Redemption Song with all the band. And I suggested to Bob that we record it. That's the only one track I ever produced completely of Bob's was that one, because it was very easy to produce, because you just asked him to play it, and he played it. And, um, and that was a rede redemption song with just the, just on guitar, the one we used on the album, because I felt that the words were so important and so poignant that they would be, they would have more impact if it was just him with a guitar. Therefore, you've heard this before? Yeah, a long time ago. I can't remember it now. And you didn't not like it at the time, that's why you didn't? I, I, I liked it, but uh, I, I didn't like it as much as I thought it would... I, I thought it would be much better if it was done just with the guitar. So that's why, you know... I talked him into doing it just with the guitar, and he was concerned that it wouldn't sound right on the album, because all the rest of the album had, you know, bass and drums and stuff, so I suggested that at the, we'll put it right at the last track and leave a 15 second inter, uh, you know, um, interval between the track before it, so it was like a postscript. So, so it sounded very much like it too. Well, the well, you know, it's a postscript. Yeah. Thing. Well, none of us were to know that that was the last track he was going to record it. Well, I'll just say one word about the project we have. We'll, we'll get back to that, I suppose, in, in a while. But shortly, um, we're trying to get... I'm trying to convince, uh, convince the owner of Best Magazine to do a special issue on Bob Marley for this whole thing. Oh, it's like a 100-page uh, thing. I'm a dedicated fan of Bob Marley, and I'm a musician first, and an artist, but I also write a bit. And that sort of project would be, you know, uh, something I'd have an incentive to do. I, I, I would love to, Great. to bother to do that. Well, how can we help persuade him? Um, right. Well, we'll get to that, I okay. suppose. I just wanted to know, let you know that this interview is meant for that. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll, we will get to that, and uh, Jean-Pierre Veller will, will talk to you about it. Okay. Um, we shall persuade her, I'm sure. Okay. So I have several uh, questions I thought about, and I guess the, the one is to, to deal with the first time you met Bob and how that happened. Or well, first time you heard of him, I suppose, because you must have heard him over the radio in Jamaica? <coughs> no, I first heard of him in about 1962, I guess, when I got a tape which was sent to me in England, because when I started in England, I, I had started first in Jamaica, and then I decided to go to England and represent my competitors in Jamaica. And one of the people who, in fact, invested in the company initially, in Ireland Records initially, was a guy called Leslie Kong, who had a company called Beverly's, and he was a very successful producer. He discovered really a lot of artists. He recorded a lot of people first. Uh, Jimmy Cliff was one of them, and Bob was another. And um, I got this tape in a little box, which said uh, Bob. It said, no, it said it said Robert Morley on it. And I remember thinking of the actor, the English actor Robert Morley, and. You know, it's it, I, that, that's why that's the only reason I really remember it because I would have got lots of tapes at the time, but I always remember very specifically this this tape which said Robert Morley on it, and I was trying to connect that with the image of this English actor. Uh, so we put it out. We put out the first record under the name of, I think Robert Morley or Bob Morley, but not Bob Marley, and um, that's when I first saw the name. See, when did you first meet Bob then? 
in London. I, I first met him in 71. I thought it was 72. Was it 71? So, I'm not good at dates, but it was, it was in London, and I thought it was 72. Well, that's what it says in the book. Oh, really? Which book is that? Stephen Davis. Oh, okay. Well, may maybe, maybe he's right. And I found out some things about you, I suppose, that some, some of it at least must be accurate. Yeah. That's in your, some of your childhood and so on. And we won't get back to that. <laughs> but, um, so you met Bob then, but, um, so how, how did your relationship happen with the other members of the band, you know, like Peter and... And Bunny and well, when I first met Bob was also when I first met Peter and Bunny because they were all in England after coming from Scandinavia, uh, where they had gone to do the music for a film for Johnny Nash, and I think that collapsed and they were left stranded, and they and they had sent a message that uh, you know they were in London and was I interested in signing them? I think they were kind of broke in London. They were kind yeah. of, and uh, so. I had just parted with Jimmy Cliff, and uh, I was very upset about it because I felt that um, that we were about to really break Jimmy Cliff because the the character he played in The Harder They Come I felt was really the kind of image of a character who could really break reggae music because you really needed a kind of rebel type image to do that. But Jimmy left and decided he would. He made a deal with EMI. So I was kind of upset about it. And then within a week of that, I got this call that Bob Marley was there. And Bob Marley and the Whalers. So I said, great, send them in. So I met them all. And I made a deal with them right, right there and then. Because you see, at the time, if I remember, you didn't really have many black artists, although you obviously started with that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, were licensing stuff in England. Right. For a long time, you were concentrating on bands like, such as Crimson and Jim Martin and so on. That's right. And suddenly, you know, there was like a curve, a change, and you got into that and into, I guess, several other reggae artists. And was that because you were going through this, this scene with, with Jimmy Cliff, who was really your only black artist, if I can remember? He was the only, he was, I, I left reggae music from about 1966, from the right. time that I got involved with Spencer Davis Group. I really, that kind of, I went on that trip and into a kind of whole rock and roll world and I wasn't really involved at all with any Jamaican music until Jimmy Cliff, who I'd worked with from a long time back, he went to Brazil and on his way back from Brazil, he stopped in Jamaica and recorded with the same Leslie Kong again, a very good album, which was called Wonderful World, Beautiful People in the Air, and it had some very good songs in it. And I kind of got involved with that. Um, helping him compile the record, helping him market the record or marketing the record for him. And um, so I kind of got back into it in about 1969, but still didn't have any other artists other than Jimmy Cliff. So when he left, I, I then signed Bob. But I still didn't sign any other Jamaican artists for some time. It wasn't until about 1974 that I started to sign other artists because I felt that Bob was, Bob was really starting to happen and he was it was kind of happening for him. And then it made sense to sign some other artists because there was developing a demand for other music of the same genre, the same being reggae music. I mean, the other artists weren't Bob Marley, but uh, there, was, there was a demand now for, for reggae music, so I signed other artists. I understand that uh, the first couple of albums or so were recorded in Jamaica and then some overdubs were made over here in Europe. But um, what was your exact part in, in the music as a producer in those artists? And did it change through the years, or what happened? Yeah, well, on the first record, um, I made the deal with Bob. I gave Bob some money to go and make a record. Everybody felt that, you know, I would never really get a record, and, you know, they would disappear with the money, and that would be that. But a few months later, I went to Jamaica, and they took me to Harry J's studio and played me what they had recorded. And it sounded really good to me. I thought it was just fantastic, the songs. They played Concrete Jungle, Slave Driver, Midnight Ravers, We Don't Need No Trouble, you know, uh, what was the other one? Kinky Reggae. All of these songs I thought were really great. And um, so what happened is we took those tapes back to England, which were recorded on 8-track, and then bounced them over, I think, to 16-track, and then overdubbed 
stuff and lengthened, lengthened some of the tracks because what I wanted to do was to put some solos into the music because the way that I felt to break the Wailers because though the artist I signed was Bob Marley in the Wailers, I, I really changed the name as it were just to the Wailers because I felt that what we needed to project was like a black group because at this time now I was really in the rock world and I felt the best way to break these artists were almost like a black rock act and that's why I put solos in it because there were never really solos in reggae music. There were solos in ska music, the very earliest music was all jazz musicians who started that. But in reggae music it was very much more novelty music really. It wasn't really quote serious music. It wasn't viewed seriously. It was viewed as fun or novelty music. And I felt that the, that the Wailers was serious and, and could really be huge. So uh, what we did was, you know, we overdubbed stuff. We, I used this guy Rabbit and I used another guy called Wayne Perkins who was a guitarist and tried to expand the music a bit and make it more rock-like, make it less kind of pop-like. And that was really a deliberate attempt. So so I would have d oh, I overdubbed those and mixed that in England. And then the same thing to a slightly lesser degree on on um, on the on the next record on Burning. I didn't have quite so much uh, overdubs on Burning. Burning was a little more um, straight straightforward. But by then they had also kind of expanded. They'd taken Catch a Fire and made Burning was more in the vein of Catch Catch a Fire itself. So there wasn't that, that much need for me to do stuff on it. So I still mixed that record with them in uh, London. I see. If you, if you had um, licensed the tapes that Lee Perry produced in the early 70s yeah. of the same tracks, which actually happened to have just come out today, and I'm sure you'll have something to say about that, um, do you think that the, these recordings could have made it in the same way that the early island recordings have? Because of the sound they had, because of the fact they didn't have the, you know, they didn't have the lead guitar parts, they didn't have any of what you just mentioned. Do you think these tapes could have made it if you had promoted the band as they were, without what you just mentioned? I think we needed that element in it. I think we needed it because, you know, I mean, I, w I worked in some to, to varying degrees on all the records of Bob's, with the exception of uh, Surviving. It's the only one I didn't work on at all. All the others I worked on, the ones on Ireland. And, uh, and the first one had the most overdubs and the most rockish stuff in it. The very last one had was the most natural, you know, uh, Uprising, which is the last one, was the most kind of natural, raw recording. And I felt that you needed the first one to pull in the mus uh, musicians. So I really sent, I, I mean, I sent the records to musicians early on, various musicians, one of which was Eric Clapton, and that's why he probably did I shot the sheriff. But I sent it to the kind of, quote, tastemakers, musicians and other kind of key people saying, you know, I really believe, I think this is really great, you should listen to this, etc., etc., that kind of thing. I think if we'd sent the, the one that Lee Perry released, I don't think it, it would have, it, it, it was tuned enough to bring in that element. You know, even though those records are fantastic records, and Lee Perry, to me, is the greatest uh, producer and cut the best tracks with Bob, really. I think that that you needed that overdub element as a kind of translation to bringing in the outside world. What was Bob's and, and the other musicians' reaction to this um, projection of yours on their music? How, because like Peter would do the lead guitar normally, I think, in the band. How, come, well, how did they take it when you came up with Wayne Perkins and other musicians? What well, was Peter, Peter was not a lead guitarist. Peter was a great rhythm guitarist. But he never really played lead, even on his own stuff. He had a, he, I mean, he, when he started his own band, he did the same thing. He brought in an American guitarist. So I think, I think they were very positive about it. I, in fact, I, I'm sure they were positive about it because they, all of them certainly were not shy to say what they felt about anything. So if they hadn't liked it, they would certainly have said it. <laughs> what was the relationship with Bob as a, as a person? How was he first as a businessman? Obviously, we, we know that you know, there were some fears of, of, of rude boys in the early 70s and, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to deal with Rastas and all rude boys or basically Jamaicans, but how, how did that happen with you and how did it evolve through the years? 
Well, you know, I always respected him from the first time I met him. Uh, I respected him and I always in general respect ev everybody. So I've not really been, uh, I didn't treat him as a lot of the artists in Jamaica were treated by the producers at the time on the basis that there were millions of them and uh, if they didn't like it, they could go somewhere and they'd get somebody else. So I think that he reacted positively to the fact that I treated him with respect, which was pr you know, a pretty natural thing to do, really. But uh, I think he reacted positively to that. And more specifically, I think probably because I actually gave him the cash ahead of time and said, that's you, you take responsibility, you give me the record, rather than you know, giving it in dollar by dollar as you hear the tape. You know. So you reckon Bob had a good opinion of you? Did that um, evolve through the years? There was there difficulties or better times, business-wise? I mean, no. I think I think I think the one thing he was disappointed in, and uh, the one thing that w Ireland was not able to deliver for him, was success in the Black American market, and I think that was the one thing that he was he wanted very badly, and and. Um, felt that we kind of failed him in that regard. But it was very difficult to get into that market, and the one track that could have done it, Could You Be Loved, he was just going to America to tour when he got sick. So I think we were on the verge of, uh, of doing it, but we'd, not, we'd never done it up until then, and he, that, that's something he really wanted to do very, very badly. Did that happen after his death? Well, it happened with Ziggy. It didn't happen with Bob. We, we still, I mean, now the black American market buy Bob Marley's records a lot, but he's never had a hit record, as it were, you know, a top ten record in the black charts, whereas his son went to number one, which is great. Which track was that? Tumbling, Tumbling Down. Oh, yes? It was a remix done by Hank Shockley, which went to number one. How come he's not on Ireland? Well, listen, it's... Uh, it's it's very difficult to work with two different generations of people, you know. It's tough enough for two generations, even in the same family, to get on, much less for me than to work with, you know, there's always been a problem. So, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm very fond of him, and I see him quite a bit, and uh, we chatted before, um, you know, he made a deal, and I talked to her about it, and I said kind of what I wanted him to do, you know, what I wanted him to do was to not come on the scene until he developed a kind of unique sound of his own. I felt he really needed to do that because I was concerned that it was going to be a kind of a Julian Lennon situation where everybody embraces him immediately and then discards him too quickly. But he's managed to get over that and sustain. What, what is your relationship with Lee Perry like today? I'm sure you have a couple of anecdotes here and there through the years. <laughs> Well, From the time, excuse me, um, because I, I think about Lee Perry as a person who probably felt that Bob, Bob and the Whalers were taken away from him in a way, and he probably was hurt at the time. What is your opinion on that, and how did that sort of relationship evolve? Because he, he did work again with you in, in the late 70s. Yeah, well, I never really worked with, with uh, Scratch until the late 70s, when, when I started to work with him a lot, and I did a lot of records with him. Um, we released a lot of his things. He's the greatest talent that, uh, you know, as a producer, including everybody that I've ever personally sort of seen at close quarters. He's an absolute genius. When you consider all the records that he made were made on a four-track TIAC, not even a proper four-track machine uh, where you have to bounce the tracks all the time. All his records were made on that in this little tiny studio, Black Ark studio that he had. So. What he created was really extraordinary, and his sense of rhythm and his ability to, 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 to just get out of musicians, something really unique. He was, he was really, really special, but he kind of went a little crazy. He went more than a little crazy, he went crazy. Slowly, he went really crazy. There was a time that you'd go into his studio, and everything was pristine, and if you were smoking a cigarette or a joint or something like that, and you know, he'd immediately sort of frown, but give, put an ashtray right there in case you happened to drop any ash on the floor. He was pristine. And if you might say to him, um, that track you recorded in, you know, two, three years back, such and such, uh, uh, do you remember it? I'd love to hear it. He'd just climb up and he'd go to the limb and he'd pull it right out, 
immediately put it on and it was there immediately. Ev everything was foul. Everything, in other words, was perfection. Absolutely slick and clean and polished and neat and tidy and everything. And then everything kind of started to deteriorate, deteriorate, until it eventually he, he, uh, he, set his, he set his studio on fire. Why did he do that, do you reckon? He told me he did that because some, there were some people who came that were bad people and he wanted to get rid of them. Uh, and, uh, and so he pretended to be crazy to scare them off. That's what he always told me. But I said, listen, I mean, to me, I think you're behaving like crazy. He said, no, I'm not really crazy. I'm just scaring, scaring them off. The husband of one of our producers at Radio Nova was there when that happened. When he burnt up everything? Yes, and he went inside the studio and there was like water. He flooded the studio first to have this earth water yeah. fire thing. And he didn't know that, our friend didn't know there was petrol over the water. And he set fire to the studio as the guy was inside. And suddenly this seal of fire came in and started burning him as well. And he was going inside to pick up some things so they wouldn't get destroyed. And so this guy almost lost his life at the time. And um, I never really understood why. Well, you should ask him, what did he think? Or didn't he think Lee Perry went a little crazy? I mean, fancy burning up everything what that he had there. He didn't burn the tapes, did he? I don't know if he burnt the tapes or not. But some, some surfaced. Yeah. But they might have been abroad, they might have been overseas. I don't know if he had them, if he kept them. I think, I, I, I would doubt, I, I, I would doubt if he kept them. Because he burnt up everything, he destroyed everything. He destroyed his house, he painted over everything. This friend must have told you, he painted words over everything. Everywhere in his house, everything. La last time I saw him in the house, he had a drum machine. And every time he walked by it, he just hit it, and you know it would play a different rhythm, and that was it going on all the time. There's um pa pa um pa pa, and then he'd walk by and he'd touch it and go um pa pa um pa pa, or and and then he had his watch and his rings and his kind of thi all this stuff. He had this on a dressing table, not inside the house, outside the house by the gate. He was really he'd gone kind of wacker. Have you heard this record he did about you called Judgment in a Babylon? Yeah. What do you think of that? Listen, he was upset because I didn't take one of his records. He did a record, and I'd, I'd done, from his point of view, I would imagine that he would have felt that I let him down because I did a lot of records with him. And then he did this record, and, and th there was a little bit of history in, in, in between, which I can go into if you want, but then he came up with this record, and the record just wasn't good, so I didn't take the record. So he was very upset. But I mean, you know, before that, when I thought he was getting better and getting himself together, I gave him $25,000 to go up to New York to buy some equipment to re put his studio back in shape. He went up to New York, he blew the $25,000, he went into Cartier or, or some such high quality store and bought an entire set of silver and glass, you know, cost, you know, God knows how many thousands of dollars. And uh, he, he just blew it all in a minute, and, uh, and he never, he never did, he never did anything. Got himself in a whole heap of trouble there, staying, uh, staying in somebody's apartment, and painted all the apartment, and painted the, um, the passageway out, and he was finally thrown out of the building when he was starting to paint the elevator. <laughs> but uh, I've seen him in Jamaica again now, and he's, he's, you know, we're all kind of friends again. Could I find him if I did go to Jamaica this summer? Yeah, but he's doing. He's in very bad shape. I see. Um, well, one last thing about Lee Perry. Sorry, but maybe you want to read this. Uh, All right, stop this. Sorry. Okay, I see. I see. It's just today in New York. I was just wondering whether why, why these uh, tapes came out on Isleden, you know, and uh, huh? I've just wondered why. Some of his early, uh, Bob Marley's early recordings never came out on Ireland. And I just can see that this is finally happening with this uh, full CD box set. Well, some of the early recordings we released, yes. you know, initially, like I tell you, one cup of coffee and uh, and put it on, and uh, some of the other ones, and some went to Trojan. I guess must have gone to Trojan. There's about four albums in Trojan, and now two or three more. 
of newly found tapes that are just a, a, amazing. Mm. Um, did, did come out on the sold and uh, I would always. But well, what's the stuff now? The stuff come out now? You say today? Well, yes, this month three LPs um, of most of the songs that you did with Bob on Catch a Fire and Burning, originally produced by Lee Perry. Oh, the original versions. Yes, and stuff stuff nobody's ever heard and. I was just amazed that this surfaced now, and how, how come this never came before? And I would have had, liked your opinion on hearing these tapes. You know. Haven't you heard them? This upset the record shop, volume one and two, and also his third album called Nice Time, which is marvelous, truly marvelous, much better than anything I've heard Lee Perry, Perry produced. On this is this is Lee Perry's productions too. Yes, and it has an incredible version of Concrete Jungle, for instance. Really? And all the dub versions are on, on the CDs as well. I'm surprised you don't know about it. I don't know. I don't know which record you mean. They're records that come out all the all the time. You know, there was one no, that no, came no, out on right Heartbeat. Now. The stuff has just come out. What label is it out on? That's all them. In France. And I don't know on which label it came out in England, but these tapes are definitely the best stuff I've heard by Marley. You know, from that period. Are they? Are they? Same tapes that you've heard before? No, no, this is brand new stuff. All nothing you've ever heard? Nothing I've ever seen. But but, but but you know the Trojan tracks, right? You know of the course. And these are completely new again? Completely. Even some of the Trojan tracks, tracks like Put It On, right. are here with much, much brighter mixes and much better quality overall, no hiss, you know, it's like, it's had all the, all the B-sides and instrumentals and it's just incredible stuff. Truly incredible stuff. And the story is that uh, it was uh, Scratch, his daughter, had kept these tapes. And this surfaced through, I think it was uh, Bunny Lee. Who? Bunny Lee. Bunny Lee? Bunny Lee just recently gave us all the tapes he had. So he said. Maybe they're the same. Oh, these are the ones you're, you're using on this for this box set. I should have brought these uh, mm. CDs. Yeah. But you'd be really interesting, interested in hearing them. Yeah, I would. I'd be interested in hearing them and seeing them because... You see, the problem is this, is that, is that Bob, or Bob's family, or Bob's estate, or foundation, or whatever, doesn't receive any royalties on any of these records. And so, you know, obviously, since I'm, I'm now, like, in charge of that, we're, we're trying to track down who, who, where these tapes come from, and how they're licensed, and how they come out. I'm and who licensed them to who, and who owns them, and who claims they own them, and how do they own them, and all that kind of thing. Well, had them scratch produced them and I'm very uh, surprised you haven't heard of these tapes haven't you really I don't know which ones I've heard you know there's so many things okay. there's a certain amount of people there's Danny Sim Natural Mystic Concrete Jungle Concrete Jungle um, Satisfy My Soul but all these have come out already those same songs you mentioned on ha Island no they've come out the, the version of what I say the, the, the Lee Perry productions those uh, those same songs have come out already, aren't they? On uh, on um, on um, no, what, Trojan Records. No. Maybe they came out on other labels I haven't heard of, but I doubt that. Mm. However, this is uh, a mystery. Well, there are two albums called Up to the Record Shop. I strongly suggest you check. And it's also one called Nice Time. Hmm. And um, I guess this puts an end to this topic. Maybe we could, could get back to, to the personality of Bob Marley, mm -hmm. you know, in another way than business, because we've been through a lot of business right. matters here. You know, and how maybe you know some of the readers would love to know what was Bob like as a person, in a much more intimate way. What is he like as a person? <laughs> well, you have to remember that my involvement with him was very much on a working relationship with him. I never spent any time with him unless I was in the studio, or if it, I was on tour with him, or if uh, we were meeting to discuss a strategy or what we were going to do, or whether we were going to tour or not going to tour, or what would happen. I never spent any time with him at all other than that. What was he like in the studio then? Well, he was great in the studio. He was, I mean, he was, uh, he was very open to ideas. He was very clear what he wanted to do, but very open to ideas. Like somebody who has a lot of self-confidence, they're very open to what anybody has to say. It's usually people who does, don't have much confidence who don't want to hear what anybody else has. So he was very open. He would know what he was doing, but if somebody said something, 
he'd listen and he'd either do it or he wouldn't do it, depending on whether he thought it was a good idea or it would work or not. So he was very clear what he was doing, and he was not somebody... I guess the main thing I could say about him, which I think is interesting, is that, is that he, <coughs> on tour, he would always be the first person on the bus. He'd be the first person down waiting for it. In the studio, he'd be the first person at the studio. He would never be the star type character who let everybody get started and then he'd come down three or four hours later. He'd be there right at the beginning. He, he led by example, not because he was paying everybody or because he was the boss. He led because he was a leader. He was a natural leader. He was there first. And that was the thing which was, I think, really unique about him. He wasn't somebody who traveled first class and the rest of his band traveled economy. They either all traveled economy or if they could afford it or, or later on, they would all travel first class. You know, he never sat in a s special place in the bus, which was his place in the bus. You know, he would... Uh, what was Family Man's uh, importance in the band or Peter Tosh or any of these guys? Who, who, who was... Uh, obviously, he was leading. Yeah. But who, who else was there that was really strong? Family Man was very strong. Family Man was like the roots anchor for Bob, because the bass, after all, is the is the you know the foremost instrument of reggae music, the key instrument of re reggae music. Tyrone was very important too, because Tyrone brought the the kind of sizzle to his music, the the well the the technology, for want of a better word, to his music. Um, I think those two were really probably the most important. The Those two are probably the, the key guys. To an extent, Junior, uh, guitarist, was, was, was important in the later, uh, the later years because Junior was one who went out a lot and chatted to a lot of people and was, it was very easy for him to communicate, whereas Bob was very private and very shy, basically. So he, would, he wouldn't really talk, he wouldn't chat to people a lot. You know, if he, if he had an interview to do, he would talk, but other than that, he wouldn't really go out and chat to people a lot. So Junior was more the one who would be the one who he'd send out ahead to go and chat to everybody and, you know, sort of open up things. Yes, Junior told me that he was responsible, I guess, partly for having a sort of more a European mix to the songs, have less bass and more, you know, of an influence that I thought you would have, and have, has had, over the early records anyway. And uh, do you believe that Junior's part was, uh, was that, that important? Well, I think Junior, uh, Junior and Tyron. Junior and Tyron. I think, I think, I think both of them. You see, what, what reggae in general has been and is, basically, is bass and drum, and nothing happening really in the middle except the ska. You know, just the ska beat. Never anything, never any kind of riff or any kind of other color to, to kind of, you know, tickle the ears and stuff. There was nothing really ever going on there. Tyrone and Junior would put those elements into it, like in something like uh, Could You Be Loved, the, the guitar type thing. And Tyrone also, Tyrone would do more than just the, you know, the either the organ feel or the piano feel. So. Those two guys were important in making the music more um, more accessible, I think, to people. It had it had more musicianship in it than than most reggae, which was strictly bass and drum, and then the top. It's like let's say Sly and Robbie. If you ask Sly and Robbie to produce a record, they'll they'll deliver a great bass and drum track, and then they'll put the voice on. As far as they're concerned, that's the end of the record. You know, what was Neville Garrick's influence on Bob? I think it, it, I met that guy, and he, he felt like a strong character that had a lot of intelligence and ideas. Yeah, well, Neville is. He is a strong character. He does have a lot of ideas. But when he was around Bob, he hardly spoke. He was very much in awe of Bob. He adored Bob. And, um, and worked a tremendous amount, contributed a lot to Bob. Uh, in terms of helping him with all the lighting and with uh, with the graphics and things like that, he was he was also somebody who really was was Bob's sort of kind of ambassador out to the world kind of thing. He would go out and I would deal a lot with Neville, for example, and all things other than the actual music and touring would be the only 
things that I deal with Bob about, but everything else like that I would pretty much deal with Neville um, on how the packaging would go. And we'd, at the end of it, you know, either I'd show it or usually Neville would show it to Bob and Bob would say yes or no and pretty much he was usually happy with everything. I see, but who was then um, responsible, if I dare say, for Bob's spiritual awakening and this political dim and social dimension that definitely was responsible for one part of his greatness? I'm not sure about that. I think, I think Neville could have had some input into that. I'm not sure. I really don't know. I didn't, because that wasn't my area of expertise whatsoever. I tried to dissuade Bob from going to Zimbabwe and doing, you know, the performance, because I told him economically it made no sense. So my real relationship was one of a business relationship, so I didn't contribute anything I, uh, to Bob in, in any of that area, of all that area of his, his growth. And who? I don't know. I can't tell you, actually. I can't really tell you. I think... I think just from traveling, I guess, he just absorbed. I'm not really sure. I really don't know. Well, Bunny was a rasta before him. Yes, but Bunny, but Bunny is, uh, but Bunny was not really on the scene since 1973, really. Well, yeah, but Bob's trip was there before 73. Oh, of course, very much so. But um, I think. You mean the spiritual awakening, awakening in Tarasta in the initial stages, or you mean when he became more, I thought you meant when he became sort of a more international in his approach. Well, I guess he, he had all that before he, he went international, although obviously yeah. he developed later and yeah. became one great part of his personality. I just wanted to have your point of view on that. I don't know who that would be, or where that came from, whether it came from reading. He used to read a lot. He used to be very interested in international politics and and I uh, used to read a lot, a lot, read newspapers a lot, read magazines a lot. I think, I think that was probably, probably where he learnt a lot from. And of course, travelling, he would, he would, you know, he would absorb things, you know. He would absorb information when he would travel. What do you think about the spiritual dimension, of, obviously, of, of, of the way this music is, is very important today? And I can see that... Um, 1992, we have more. Bob's music has, is having more of an impact than it ever had I think, in Africa, mm -hmm. and the Rasta message is spreading worldwide more than ever. Definitely more than at the time of his life, in his lifetime. And uh, I wonder how relevant that is today, and, and what is the understanding people can have of that, and you know how accurate it is with history and. Uh, I understand that um, if this book doesn't uh, tell me wrong, your mother was Jewish. You you may have been interested in uh, the origins of the Orthodox Church, of the the, the Falasha people who moved into Ethiopia, and the whole story about the Torah being written by black people. And there's an Afrocentrism theory today, which tells us all about that. And where is Zion? And you know, there's a lot of things that could be said. I would just like to have your point of view on that because it's uh, definitely a great matter today because Bob's message is really Rasta and how much sense does it make? I'll just add one more, th one more thing. It's, uh, Linton Kuzi Johnson told me that it did not make much sense to him today and that um, a more sort of adult attitude was definitely what he kept in mind for black people. Mm. But uh, I just well, don't know what you think. I think the real important relevance of, of Haile Selassie and the Rasta religion was that uh, that in the West, all the churches, Catholic, all the religions, etc., uh, you know, you'd go into a church, you'd see a crucifix, you'd see a white person being crucified. And so God was basically white. And uh, all, all the blacks in the New World basically had come there as slaves. And so they had no history, no nothing. Everything was white. And I think the importance and the relevance of Haile Selassie was that he was a, a, a direct descendant of Solomon and Sheba. And, and the only times that you'd ever seen Solomon or Sheba, uh, anybody had imagined, they had imagined they were white because you saw Gene Simmons playing them in biblical movies or Victor Mature or, or you know, some uh, Hollywood movie actor. But there was no black image as, as, as uh, a deity. And I think that that was really the important relevance of, of, of Haile Selassie. 
And I thought, and and I think that's where the Rasta thing started. I see. So this is the important thing. How how you know how, how could that go with the white attitude today? Where can, can this these two visions mesh, or is it going to be uh, a clash? between the two, like it may seem to be sometimes. Well, I think, I think more and more people now realize that, you know, these stars of the Bible were, n were not white people. You know, they were no. people of color. So I think, I think, I think that's just more important. I mean, um, uh, Neville and Rita just came from Ethiopia. You know, they just went to Ethiopia. And just the history of Ethiopia, the history, the you know, the age of the church, the three thousand year old churches, and the, the, these, the this kind of thing is is something which is, I think, so important for blacks that are in the Western world, because they there is no history, they have no history, they're not a, they're, 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 they've not been, there's no history like that taught in schools. They go to school, there's no. African history that is really taught. Now, how relevant is this history going to be to us, Europeans? Well, I think it's relevant. I think uh, it's important to me. Oh yeah, as a key figure in, in in the development of this culture. Well, I think I think it's um, I think it's very important because it's something which 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 just um, I think helps white people in the West appreciate the history of black people rather than not recognizing that they have any history, not even thinking that they have any history, thinking that it comes Africa is kind of a jungle where these people came from. I think that's really what's important, really important. So, and I think, I, 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 I think the more that that can come out, the better. The more that that can be exposed, the better. Because it's still not generally exposed. You know, still, still, you know, there is very little black history which is, which is known. I see. So you, do, do you reckon, as a history, uh, as a historical point of view, this is, uh, is it time yet? I'll just leave five minutes, I'll just... Okay. okay. Um, you know, Bob Marley has a, sorry, Bob Marley, does he fail? Bob Marley as a, as, a, as a figure today stands, will be looked at, you know, in history as someone who's done that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I like to talk about. Well, I think, I think, I think what Bob has stands for really is that um, as a real working class hero, as John Lennon would say, somebody who has really come from the underclass and has risen really to the top, but in a real sense, in a lasting sense, as a real role model, as a real example of somebody who was a, a real natural leader and used his ability to write songs and to entertain, to basically educate and give people a sense of pride and a sense of hope. I think that's really what he has achieved in his lifetime and why I think he will really live forever. How, how could you compare him to Marcus Garvey? Um, Marcus Garvey was... Marcus Garvey was... Um, was somebody who I... I think who first sort of stood up and said, hold on, you know, give us some respect. And um, tried to do a lot, really attempted to do a lot. But it was in a different era. It was in an era before one was able to reach a lot of people through the media, through entertainment, through television, etc. I think if Marcus Garvey had lived at a different time, I think if Marcus Garvey had lived at a different time, he would have he would have achieved he would have been able to have achieved lot a lot more. He was uh, he had no access to uh, the media. 
the media at that time was not as open as it is now. It's much more open now. Somebody can, you know, make a record. If the record is successful, the message of that record can reach a lot of people. At his, at, at, in, in his period, that wasn't really possible. So the, the white media tended to ridicule what he was doing, tended to ridicule him, tended to, to, to try and discredit him, and did indeed discredit him in many ways, and, 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 and so really destroyed him. I happened to uh, write the titles for the Time Will Tell film in French, oh. and that sort of vibe is definitely very, very present in that film. In fact, it struck me very much you know, to see this massive personality come, you know, going for dignity, and I didn't feel it that much, quite that much in the rest of the, in the music. I mean, it was just like something that overwhelmed me completely as I watched the film. And I think that uh, it really gave me an incentive to try to go further in that direction, because as you, as you say, this is definitely uh, just so important. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to get this special issue together and do something really with dignity and to tell more about that. But how can we do that, you see, because I didn't feel that that much. I mean, I did, but it wasn't such, a, such an obvious, it wasn't that strong then, you know, and, and it's really st striking me now that my part must not people, do people go the right way when they go Rasta? Or maybe Linton Quincy Johnson's um, point of view is a little more interesting and maybe a little intellectual, but cer certainly uh, less accessible, or what? You know, I'm just trying to somehow, you know, get people in the right direction if I can. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know really the answer to it, except that I think that what he was singing about is still relevant. Um, I don't think you have to be Rasta to relate to it at all. I think it's relevant for everybody. Um, I travel a lot, I, you know, and uh, there have been various different places where I've seen Bob's music and more importantly posters or t-shirts or images of Bob, the most extraordinary places you would never expect it. I mean, the first place, which was a long time ago, was in the Indian Reservation in Arizona. I was astounded by that. But Bob is a huge hero for the Indians. And then, uh, just recently, in March, I went to the Cartagena Music Festival in Colombia. Cartagena Music Festival just deals with Caribbean music, but not really reggae music, really Spanish-speaking music, merengue music, uh, uh, cumbia music, you, you know, really the Latin music. And in this, uh, in this uh, sort of bullring type place where there was this incredible concert and everybody was rocking and shouting and screaming, I just started to look at the audience just, you know, to get that vibe when you see a whole, it's exciting when you see a whole audience alive. And I looked up there and I saw something and I couldn't believe it. It was a, a guy, three guys together, but one guy was holding this flag of Bob Marley. I have no idea why. It's extraordinary. Why would he be hold why would he take it to this concert? Why would he be holding it up? Why would it be? It was just extraordinary to me. I, I couldn't be there. I got somebody there and said, You've got to take a photograph of this. I've just got to see this again sometime, you know, that I'm really seeing. It was extraordinary. And then again I was in Indonesia, you know, I was in Bali, and in Bali I went into a a, a, a shop and there was this huge fabric, huge poster printed on fabric, which was in one of the stores. These are all totally different cultures. I mean, the obviously there's Africa, where it exists, and obviously there's the West, and other, uh, you know, and America. But it's extraordinary how all these different corners of the world Bob has reached. So he's touched them all. They're not rasters. He's touched them all with a, a common, uh, you know, message. I would say that today Bob Marley is the only superstar in this world that really has reached the far extremes of the world, more so than you know Elvis Presley or the Beatles even. Mm. Although you know this could be argued, but I think it is. I, th I really think it is. But you now, as a person, have, have you, you've had your part in this story, you know, and obviously um, it's a great story. Uh, are you trying to do that again? with other artists. 
Uh, do you think uh, anybody could ever compete with this story? Or do you still have the same sort of frame of mind in, in uh, signing artists today? And I can see that you're very much interested in the music from Miami and this, this part of the world. Mm. Um, I'd like your point of view on the future, you know. Of music? Well, or of, 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 of your part in, in well, promoting artists. Well, first Why do you do that now, after doing Bob Marley? Well, um, I have to admit that <laughs> it's unlikely to find, I'm unlikely to find anything quite as stimulating as it was working with Bob Marley, because I was working very closely with him. So I was, you know, I mean, you too is, uh, are an incredible group and have something very important to say, but I don't work that closely with them. I'm not involved with them in the same way as I was with Bob. I mean, I'm an they, they record for Island Records, and I'm good friends with them, and I see them, and now and again, I have a little bit of advice or something here and there. But it's nothing like the same relationship that I had with Bob. Now, still today, and up until at least the 1st of uh, January 2000, I continue to work with Bob's family, and the foundation, I've set up this foundation, and I'm working with them. And my plan, really, is to set up something which hopefully will be structured in such a way that it can last for a very long time. Um, other than that, in terms of my personal music interests, yes, I'm interested in now in, in Miami. I'm, I'm basing myself in Miami. I would love to, to find and develop a young, strong image of Hispanic music of Latin music. I think Latin music is fantastic music, but there is no, there, is, there isn't anybody, there isn't, there isn't somebody who represents the youth culture of that music. And I think there is a huge gap there. And I think Miami is the place where one is probably most likely to find that, because Miami is really the kind of capital of that, of the third world of that area. So I'm set up there to be there. I'm with you. Any artists that seem likely to be good yeah. enough? <laughs> not yet, but I mean, you know, you're not going to find it in a minute like that. You well, know. maybe you, you've signed them already, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, there's a, there's a Hispanic wave right here in France right now. Is there? Well, we've yeah. dealt a lot with it on Radio Nova. We're, we're definitely spearheads of that. For sure. ah. But we are, we well, Bezo comes down to Miami all the time, and he's. Mm. he's uh, we always have to turn on, on you know, British music. Yeah. Right. Well, that's why I was saying that just the other day. There's, you know, in the 40s and 50s, popular music was full of Latin Latin music. The biggest stars were all, all had a Latin base to them. Yes. Biggest pop stars of their time. Yeah, you make very much sense. Mm. So, so, um, okay. So you can't you can't really mention anybody that that has struck you as a being that voice of, of Latin American. Not yet. Strange, because it's true, there's so much going on, and, and Latin uh, culture is definitely completely overtaking. So and also, you see, you can't, it's not something that you can, you know, put out an, adv uh, an ad in the paper and say we're looking for, you know, because such a person who decides he's going to, ah, oh, that's what's needed, okay, well, I'll write like that. That's not what I'm looking for. You need somebody who's really writing it from the heart. Bob's not somebody who you said will write a song like that. And you, you know what I mean? I mean, the closest to that, I, that's why I left it off the box set, I felt, was Punky Reggae Party, which I felt was something that was written for a particular time as a kind of a little fashion moment, but wasn't really the essence of what Bob was all about. Okay, here we go, because this is something, something I'm upset about. Why do we have to wait for so long to get all these tracks? They do this with Charlie Parker. You know, you have to wait for 30 years to realize that Verb Records have two hours left with a jam with Ella Fitzgerald in the basement somewhere, and they wait till they, or anybody that's interested is dead to put it out. And now, here we go with this. There's this redemption song, and there's punky reggae parties. Nobody's got it. And punky I've reggae party. People have that came out. That's well, been released. Yes, but that's a long time ago now. 1978? Yeah, it's 15 years ago. What about the kids? They weren't even born then. 
Why, why do we have to wait for so long to get these records out? Why, you know... We'll put Punky Reggae Party on another record sometime, I guess. All right. <laughs> but uh, the main reason that we didn't put this out before, because we wanted to wait until all the legal wrangles were sorted out with the, with the administrators. So we really wanted to wait until all that was finished before we, we put out this record. Okay, sorry to <laughs> have a go at you. But how much stuff is there left now that we can... That is I don't know. What I do know is that Ritter has this vault, which I never knew about until ah. a few weeks ago. Yeah. And she has this vault from which yeah. we found some of these tracks, which she didn't know about, oh. nobody knew about. I can't believe this. No, Barbara Who? Barbara. Uh, if, can you get her number and I'll ring her back? I'm just amazed uh, that you wouldn't know about that, that and that you wouldn't know about these Lee Perry unreleased songs. I, mean, just, I can't believe two, that. One, I, I find it hard to believe at least. I'll tell you why. I'm not a collector at all. I don't have any of my own Four, records. Five, I don't have anything. Five, I'm just not a collector. I'm somebody who just looks yeah, forward. And I, 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 I'm not a collector. I didn't put this record together. When it was together, I listened to it and I had my opinion that I thought that some of the ones which were some of, of the more rare or obscure type tracks I thought one should take off because I felt that there was a reason sometimes these didn't come out. The reason was that they weren't good enough. So I think you have to really think before you put those things out because, you know, I, I was, you know, I, on some of them I was there. So you've done it, the tune is not really uh, on, on, on Talking Blues. We put out Amadou. That's one of the tracks. But listen, Amadou was cut, yeah, it was cut the same day as we, we cut um, No Woman, No Cry was coming for it wasn't really happening so so no it's not really happening forget about it you know let's do the solitude so you know when no woman no cry everybody got excited about that and everybody forgot about this and i just remembered there was this so i looked into it but should it really come out it, it, for on a certain level for people who are hardcore fans certainly because it's something that was done which is interesting to hear <coughs> but in general you have to think before you put the of those things out because would he really have wanted them out if he was around? So everything I do, I try and think what he wanted out when he was around. And I had and I I don't make any decision myself on anything like that because I don't think I'm quite excited. He put this out himself. Which one's that? The redemption song. Yes. Yeah well, so. you say that's not the one? Right. No, no, I think it's good. I think it's great. I think it's great. But we could have put that out or we could have put the version he did from the last concert he ever did out. But this is not in the That's not in the, on the box set. I know, I know. <laughs> I just this is not going to come out, okay. This is cool. Yeah. 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 Can you tell me, uh, is the your name and um, the Django Bar? I'm sorry? The Django for us. Yeah. Hello, this is Chris Blackwell on Radio Nova. And Chris Blackwell on Radio Nova. Hi, this is Chris Blackwell on Radio Nova. Again? Same thing? Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Chris Blackwell on the exciting Radio Nova. Do they have uh, the frequency? You know the no. No? no. One one five. And the frequency, as you must know if you're listening to this, is 101.5. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just hit you with this, this little project we have, but we don't have much time now, I think. Peut-être qu'on peut descendre, parce que comme ça, ça va rassurer les autres. Okay, so we don't want to Maybe we have to figure it out. What's the project? Just quick. Yeah, it's right. One minute. minute. One minute. One minute. We're trying to... I'm trying, but it's happening, you know. Um, the owner of Best is with us. <laughs> Hello, it's Chris Blackwell on Radio Nova. Okay. <laughs> 